All right, is anybody there? This meeting is being recorded. Oh, hey, look at that. It says it now. Did you hear that? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I, I don't, that's the first time I heard that. John is here. <laughs> yeah. Hi, John, out there. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I haven't heard from anyone. I'm assuming everyone will make it for. Yeah, except yeah, for I'm Paul. Talking. Only right, Paul said right, he wouldn't yeah, make it. Paul, yeah. But I haven't heard anyone else say they couldn't. Yeah, and Ashley sent that uh, article around. It was interesting. Yeah, we weren't trying Turing to put something. Yeah, it wasn't. Yeah, it's what's interesting about it was I, I looked at, watched the video, and I read an article or two. I mean, it's actually like building a real house. I mean, it had a foundation, and they probably ran, you know, utilities and sewer and water to those homes. And so, you know, it sounds like the developer, you know, husband, wife want to do it, but I don't know what kind of incentives they'd have, you know, like what are, I don't know if they'd have tax breaks from the town. It's kind of interesting to know, like, what, what's motivating them. I feel like in Amherst, people would be like, well, I can just build. I'm not going to spend the money on that site development costs and then put in these small homes. They'd rather than put in, you know, something else, whether it's an apartment building or bigger home. So, um, but, yeah. well, I, I think the thing is, I think there are people out there who want to do it. Remember that when I first joined the trust, I can't mind find their name, but I will again. There's a group around here who is building tiny houses. He says they can build them affordably, and who built one that I walk by every day when I went to work for a while up in up in Greenfield, and it's there. It's small. It, I think that the amount of money that they that they did it for, it's like uh, it's energy efficient and it's solar ready. It isn't actually got the panels on it yet that would be another investment for somebody but it's it's cited correctly right. and it could be and then it would be net zero or something if they did that so hi ashley hey <laughs> hey we were just talking about your article that you sent which was pretty interesting oh good it had the little video i thought it was very informative yeah and then yeah. i found some articles i mean it, i will say this was proposed <clears throat> maybe because of covid it was stalled but the the, the husband wife proposed this like in 19, 2019 and they went through permitting and it was like in 2020. And I guess it's taken this long to get built. Um, yeah, so we that's as now. quick as any other thing is built around here quicker. So hell, that's well, no. <laughs> yeah, I'm assuming, I didn't go into the details, but I'm assuming maybe with COVID there are some delays because it seemed like they were ready to go. There was an article like in 2020 and it sounded like they were and then in 21, and it sounded like, you know, they really wanted to get started, but there must have been some issue or something, maybe financing or. Well, maybe we'll ask her next month. I mean, if she yeah. can tell them, you know. Yeah. That'd be great. We're on. Well, we no one else is joining us as of yet. I guess we have a minute or two. Yeah, we have George Ryan, our note taker, and Philip Avila, who said he would come from the, uh, Human Rights Commission and more keen. Yep. Yeah. But our our trust members we could use some more of. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know. <laughs> We're all numbered here. What's happening? Oh, There's Rob. Here. There's Rob. Yeah, I told Ashley she called to ask if she could send out that information about the um, tiny homes. And I said, there's actually one, I don't know how far along it is, but there's one in Worcester too. A tiny yeah. Hi, Rob. There are, I think they're moving along. I will right, well, we get one, two. I think we have a quorum now. Yep, I think so too. There are five of us, more than five. One, two, three, four, five, six. All right, we have a quorum. I think we can start. All right, um, we're gonna start our meeting. Uh, it is uh, February 9th and the Amherst Municipal Affordable Housing Trust is now um, starting its meeting. We're gonna start, welcome everybody. Uh, and I hope you're having a good evening and welcome all the uh, attendees as well as, long, as, well as the panelists. Um, we're gonna start with a review of the minutes. So I'm gonna open it up to see if anyone has any corrections, additions, any omissions that we wanna 
ensure that um, it gets into the minutes. And again, I want to thank George Ryan for doing the minutes, who is going to be doing them this evening as well. All right, hearing no comments, I think we have all agreed that we will accept the minutes from January's meeting. Thank you. All right, we're gonna move next to our next topic, which um, Allegra is going to lead us in, um, in a discussion of a proposal for a joint listening session with the Commission on Safety and Social Justice Committee, community, I'm sorry, Community Safety and Social Justice Committee and the Human Rights Commission. So go ahead, Allegra. Hello, everybody. Um, I, in addition to being a member of this housing trust, am a co-chair of the Community Safety and Social Justice Committee. And we, a few meetings ago, had gotten a comment from a member of the public asking about hosting some listening sessions. Um, and so I think our ultimate goal would be to have some collaboration with other groups in town um, that do kind of similar work or work around issues that could be considered um, pertinent to social justice. Um, so I naturally thought that housing would be a good place to partner, um, especially with the affordability crisis I think our town is facing. Um, so that was kind of where the proposal had originated. And since our last meeting, some things have changed a little bit. So I know that we plan to do a, a public listening session probably around the end of March in conjunction with Cress. Um, and one of the things that Cress has been working a lot on is with people who are unhoused. So there is, again, some intersectionality there with the housing trust um, work in terms of getting more affordable units on, online. So I do think that that would be an area that again, trust participation could be helpful in, but there in addition to kind of the community safety and social justice um, committee, I know that the human rights committee uh, commission had actually reached out to me separately um, stating that they'd been seeing a lot of complaints around housing and, and housing rights. Um, so I do see Philip Avila is an attendee and he's one of the co-chairs of the Human Rights Commission. And then Elizabeth Haygood is also in the audience who is a commissioner. So I don't know if, um, if we can see if either of them have anything that they want to add on that. Because I, I think, um, oh, I think that's right. Can we, Nate, let uh, Elizabeth and Philip in as yeah, panelists? Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi, everyone. Welcome, welcome. I see Philip, and I assume Elizabeth is here as well. Yes, Philip, did you want to add anything to Allegra's um, comments and, and presentation? Uh, I don't think I have too much to add. I think I will just highlight that the commission does see a lot of um, complaints around housing, and we do get a lot of kind of with people with their hands up in the air, like, what do we do? What can we do? They don't want to be priced out of Amherst. Unfortunately, that is a reality that is happening to a lot of people and a lot of families, um, in particular in a lot of families, uh, BIPOC families that are being kind of priced out of this town. So um, I can't speak too much for the commission as a whole, as much as I am just an individual just trying to figure out how we can do this, but the commission is open up to listening sessions. Of course, we'd have to go and vote on it as well on, as our committee, but that's kind of where we're at right now. I don't know if Liz, you have anything else to add? I do not. I just know that there's a number of um, BIPOC members of our community who were born here, raised here, work here, do community service here, and can't afford to live here and they're struggling right now. And so Thank I am Nate, I'm a planner with the town. I, I guess I had a question when they, um, 
the complaints you hear, I mean, you said that it's about getting priced out, but are there specific issues or anything? I mean, you know, we often tell people to contact the town and maybe if it's um, something with health or safety, we could have, you know, an, you know, a, a building inspector or health inspector go out there. So I just wasn't sure if they're along those lines or if it's more things, you know, you know, like the pricing or it's like it's mainly pricing i think very few we've heard of any um like landlord tenant type situations but mm -hmm. it's mainly pricing that families are either working multiple jobs working do what they can to pay rent but it's it's just not cutting it for them and like Liz said they're families that have grown up here that have give back to this community and they're very unfortunately having to move away Um, Philip and uh, both you and and Liz. Uh, at one point, I was a member of the uh, of the uh, Human Rights Commission. When I was also there, there was also some uh, sometimes uh, you know uh, complaints around Section Eight, where you know some people felt that they were being mistreated or they were not getting access. Are you guys still getting those complaints? Um, and if if you do, you know, what, how are they being resolved? Right. So we have gotten um one or two this past year and they're being resolved um with now pamela our new dei director she is heading them and sending them in the direction to um where they need to go to yeah and i, and I know of a situation which may be familiar to other people as well of uh, an individual who is older who um, the taxes literally have um, put them in a very di difficult position um, and uh, literally lots of sort of unfortunate consequences in terms of medical issues and illness um, and literally um, almost losing their housing. And so I think the other thing to think about is safety nets. Um, I think sometimes, you know, Nate, you said, well, you can contact the town, but how many people know that they can actually contact the town and who can they contact and who's gonna call them back? So, I mean, I think there's a range of issues um, that I think would be worth listening to in terms of people's lived experiences and see how we can support that or how we can work together to make sure that we have these safety nets. Yeah, right. I mean, I think the town, you know, right, if it's health, safety or some other things, uh, that's something we can work on. You know, sometimes we try to work, talk to landlords. I mean, I will say the price increases are really, really interesting. Um, you know, and how do we deal with that? I was just talking to the finance director today about that. Like what strategies could the town have, um, you know, what creative solutions? It's something that, it, you know, it's hard to get a handle on as a municipality. And I agree that the you know, prices are going up. So, you know, I, we, I receive calls too. And so someone, I was telling the finance director that someone called and said, you know, my landlord told me my, my rent's going up two or $300, you know, and my lease ends next month or two months. And, you know, sorry, that's it. And I'm like, well, I don't, you know, I'm like, yeah, I don't know. It's really interesting. Like there's no um, rent cap, right? There's no rent control in Massachusetts. I'm like, I'm not sure. I, I thought maybe there was a limit on how much they could increase their rent, but I don't think legally there is. I think they could increase it as much as they want. Someone said, oh, it's 5%. I think maybe it used to be, but not anymore. And so, yeah, it, it was almost at a loss of how do you, you know, maybe we could just, the town could try to facilitate something, but, you know, I'm, I'm like, oh, well, did they make any improvements to the unit? You know, maybe a new kitchen or something. No, nothing. You know, they just, it's just going up and it's like, wow, $300 a month for, you know, they might just say it's cost of living, but that is, you know, incredible and probably not justified and so yeah I, I you know I really feel for this person I'm not sure what's going to happen and so you know we're trying to come up with ideas and so yeah it'd be great to hear more and maybe I guess I was wondering yeah so the listening session could be um, you know then the trust could figure out what strategies or action items could come out of this working with you know different commissions or committees or you know we could brainstorm for things I mean I guess that you know, I'd like to have a framework for it, right? So people kind of understand what's the expectation if they if they attend and they provide information, you know, maybe it takes a meeting or two, but we come up with ideas or maybe a presentation to, you know, the planning board or to, you know, town manager or council. I mean, I don't know, I, I don't wanna to go too far, but, you know, we could try to figure out what's kind of the expectation and what, what do we do with the information. Thank you for that comment, Nate. I think that's helpful to like kind of frame how we're thinking because um, 
I like action myself. Um, and Carol, I saw you had your hand up, so I don't want to. Uh, I, I was just wondering what you, what Allegra, what exactly, I still feel kind of vague about what you're actually proposing that we should do. So I'm wondering. I mean, I think there are a few different directions that could be gone in. And I think one is really just listening and hearing from people in the community about what housing is like and what affordability is like and or isn't like I guess really would be um and the like one way of looking at it just kind of listening and holding that space and the, the uh, you know the only other thing I thought of in kind of hearing about section eight being brought up is um would it be worthwhile to maybe put together some sort of more formal presentation about kind of these are your rights as a renter um, from you know whether or not you have a voucher to like what happens if you know if you do get an eviction or this kind of what are what are your rights is that some sort of house like some sort of housing rights workshop we could put together for the community or, or you know borrow from other agencies and the um, I know Holyoke I think just had a, a presentation last week about knowing your rights as a renter. Um, so perhaps reaching out to the broader community network to see if if there, a similar workshop could pre, be presented in Amherst. Um, that was the only other thought I had that might feel a little bit more concrete, but. Um, but so just wondering if you, if your landlord in Amherst just plain raises your rent there's nothing you can do about it. Is that true? Like they raise it hundreds of dollars. Exactly. And... What? Yeah, I mean, if they, they have to, you know, provide that notice at the end of a lease term. So they can't, you know, if you're in a, you know, um, you know, in a, in a lease, they can't, they can't just do it, you know, on any given month, they have to provide a notice. And if there's been complaints about something and there's say ongoing, um, issues with say the towns involved or the housing authority would be involved and they can't necessarily raise rent that could be considered retaliation you know say for instance you complain that there's you know the faucet doesn't work correctly right or your hot water is not getting hot and then your lease ends they can't then raise rent or they can and then you you know it could be considered retaliation but typically if everything's going you know say smoothly and they give you a 30-day notice or whatever two months notice and they say well you know when your lease ends you know and at the end of June, your rent's going to go up two hundred dollars a month. There's really not much recourse. Hmm. Well, maybe we need to address that specifically. I mean, I don't know. Can I mean, can even the town make a guideline that there is a rent percentage cap? Is that possible? Yeah. So, I don't, isn't it a Massachusetts? law that is there isn't run control i thought there was a massachusetts law anyway i could be wrong but yeah i think some communities have been trying to actually get that back there is uh, a right. bill mm -hmm. right now i think right. um yeah people. i know um some of the kind of tenant organizing groups that i worked with out in boston have been doing right. a lot of push around it so there's so, a tenants rights bill trying to get passed too so that people would couldn't couldn't give you some kind of a notice without making sure that they you have what your rights are about getting and a right to a lawyer and there are a bunch of tenant rights bills trying to make their way through things also <clears throat> so i want to recognize that one of our attendees has his hands up john but before john speaks i just want to say um i think we have to think very uh, carefully about a listening session or a resource um, a opportunity to do a workshop or combining it. Um, I think if we do a listening session, the individuals who come to speak have to understand that we're going to be listening because I think it can be very frustrating if they come and they feel that we can do something right away and we can't. Um, so if we, yes, so if we want to just do a listening session, or if we want to do a listening session and invite people who do have other um, knowledge and resources available, there could be an opportunity where there might be resource tables around where people can talk to them, but have the listening session first. Um, because I just remember, you know, when we did the presentation around um, the Wayfinders, um, Belchertown Road and um, Southeast Street, 
there were a couple of people who had some pretty serious situations and it was very hard not to be able to provide resources. So I think we just have to really be clear on what we want to do and what we can do and let the attendees know what it is, what the purpose of that session is, so they're not frustrated. Um, there's nothing worse than thinking that you're going to get help and all we can say is we're listening to you. Good point. All right, so John has his hand up. Uh, thanks, Erica. Um, I think that um, you need to invite specific people to speak at this. Otherwise, there's a possibility that almost no one speaks or people aren't really prepared to speak. And in particular, the kinds of people I'm thinking of would be family outreach of Amherst, either Laura um, or her deputy, um, Wei Ling, um, other people who work directly with tenants. Um, another possibility, since the issue of legal services has come up, you could invite Jen Derringer, who is the, uh, I think she's kind of the person in charge of the Northampton office of legal services. And the Northampton office covers Amherst as well as others. So I think you can invite other people to talk about the problem in addition to people who are simply tenants of these various things. I think if you do that, then you're sure you're gonna hear from people and uh, uh, you may hear from people who say, well, what would be really helpful under these circumstances is if the town of Amherst could do A, B, or C. And so you can encourage that. Although I agree with Erica, this is a listening session and you have to emphasize that and say that there'll be a follow-up session in which there'll be discussion of potential directions that the Housing Trust and the Human Rights Commission could take. Thank you, John. Uh, Sid, I think you have your hand up. Yeah. Um, uh... I hate to put Nate on, on the spot here, but do we know if the town collectively collects all of these uh, complaints that comes from different areas, some of some the areas that John has just mentioned, and we have data that shows, you know, how many complaints a year do we collect, what it is, you know, how is it focused? Is it focused on rent? Is it focused on discrimination? Is it focused on this, that, and that? Do we have kind of, kind of a central depository for this for these complaints for lack of a better word yeah you know? I, i'm not sure we do um it's a good question i think i can ask around you know i you know i think enforcement would have it if it's like health and safety you know code violations but you know say philip what you were hearing you know so pamela might write that have a few if they're directed to her or say you know someone else but um you know i'm not sure they go you know i'm not sure where i don't think there's a central database um, you know, yeah, because I mean, we keep hearing that, these anecdotal evidences, right? And right, but we don't have anything that we can point on to go to, you know, the uh, town council and say, hey, you know, this is actually data that we've we've gotten for the past three to five years, and we have a problem here, right? And this this and we have this that proves that we have a problem. So let's address it from that perspective. Yeah, I think we'd have to hopefully, you know, community legal aid in Northampton would have records you know um was it um was it i don't know if it was keith at wayfinders i think at one point had said how much um, emergency aid they had given out to amherst during the pandemic um you know community uh, action may have that too um so it's all yeah i mean i think if the town doesn't have it we might have to ask you know some service providers or organizations that you know administer whether it's like raft or other things and see if they could provide data for amherst but you know, in terms of other complaints, I'll, I'll have to ask, right? I don't know, maybe if the health department gets some too, I mean, I'm assuming it's gonna be dispersed and, you know, I might have some emails or something and Pamela, you know, and no one's been putting it in a database. Sometimes it's also sensitive, but it, we could create, you know, like a generic database, right? You said, Sid, right? So it's just, you know, discrimination 
in, you know, rent increase or like, you know, there could be categories and we don't need anything more. We don't need any sensitive information from someone just other than just uh, knowing that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Hi. Um, so A, I think a listening session is great because I think we have a lot to learn. So with all the caveats that everyone else has, has said about wanting to make sure it's clear and we're not setting people up for frustration, I, I would like to listen. Um, the, the other thing, just to Sid's point, is you know complaints are one data point and there's flaws with that data point um, because people might not know they can complain or that, you know, um, and so there's other ways we could think about it if we wanted to, and I don't know if others have already done it and, and it's not worth recreating the wheel, but I mean, looking at average income versus rent, um, you know, just data points, I mean, there's ways to show it's unaffordable, um, even if people aren't complaining. Yeah. Okay, so I think Allegra, you're asking us if we can uh, agree to be part of this listening session. Is that what you're asking us? Yeah, I mean, I think, and I think that there is still some stuff to flush out, but I think that there are a lot of good ideas that have been floated here, and I certainly would support any or all of a combination of what's been discussed um, in terms of if CSSJC is also still going to be a component um, in, in the process as well. Um, and I just want to remind people, I think it was raised maybe in a couple of meetings ago, wanting to go and do some listening sessions or going to events so we can talk to people in the community. So I think this fits right into that proposal that was made a while back. Um, I think, I mean, I, I would certainly would love to have an opportunity to work with other, with you know, the Human Rights Commission as well as your group um, to put something like this on. I think it is worthwhile listening to members in the community. And I think it's also really important for them to feel that they have access to us as well as your committee and the Human Rights Committee um, and that they're being heard and, you know, in terms of their lived experiences and their struggles. So I'd like to propose if we want to take a vote on it. Sure. So go ahead, Carol. I'm still not quite sure what we're voting on. Well, I guess we're voting on doing something jointly with these other two groups that will be a listening session. So if that's it, yeah, then it just, I, I would like to attach to the proposal somebody who's gonna actually work on making it happen from amongst us, that's all. Because just saying we're going to do it, theoretically, generically, what a nice idea. I would like some attachment of who's going to work on it. That would make me happier about voting for it. <clears throat> I, I certainly would put myself forward as a person to work on it, um, as it was an idea that I brought to the group. So <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Yay, Allegra. Allegra, <laughs> I would work with you on that. Great. All right. There are two of us. All right. So Allegra and I are from the Amherst Municipal Affordable Housing Trust agree to work with um, the SSJC and the Human Rights Commission, uh, possibly to get other joint um, committees to do listening sessions. And so we'll put something together and present the specifics. Um, so the proposal is, does the trust want to participate in these listening sessions? Do you have to do, a, do we have to do, maybe we a should motion? do a vote, vote, a vote where okay. we yeah, actually if we want to have it be formal, someone has to, you know, have a, yeah, uh, okay. the, the just made a really great motion. So then we just need um, a second and a vote. I second. And George, so, Carol, I did. It. Sid looks like he also. Um, so yes. That was good, but second. I was going to second it. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so, is there any other discussion? Um, yeah, I mean, I was going to say keep, keep me in the loop because you know, I, as we were talking, it's like I don't want to do necessarily have a survey or something, but you know, Amherst does have Engage Amherst, and we we're trying different outreach methods, you know, with the community uh, participation officers, and so. You know, maybe there's ways the town could help too. 
I mean, I'm hoping we can, but you know, just keep me in the loop because I, you know, I, same thing. I was thinking like, oh, what if we offer a few different ways to collect information? And even though it's anecdotal, I agree. I think it's, I, it'd be great to hear about it because, you know, maybe some of the strategies are, can we help facilitate conversations in a way that, you know, you know, talk to landlords about the value of having diversity and families and different, you know, just different people living in town. And so, and maybe that'll help, right? I mean, I feel like when we had the, um, the forum with the uh, landlords through the rental registration, you know, afterwards, some, some landlords, you know, called me and said, you know, I'm, I'd, I'll rent to voucher holders now. I never really considered it, but I feel a lot more comfortable. And it was like, you know, even if that was just like four or five that actually went through with it, you know, I had more than half a dozen calls and I was like, wow, that's great. So people were listening. And so I, you know, yeah, just anyways, I, I feel like we could have some ways to help, you know, get the word out and maybe collect information. So, you know, some people might not feel comfortable in, you know, speaking to someone or publicly. And so if we offer something anonymously online and that's the way they prefer to provide information, then we can do that. Great idea. So multiple ways for people to provide information and their experiences. All right, anything else before we take a final vote? Okay, so I vote yes. Carol? Yes. Ashley? Yes. Sid? Yes. Me? Allegra? Yes. Rob? Yes. Risha? Yes. The motion passes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Philip, and thank you, Elizabeth, for joining us. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for inviting us, and thank you so much for this. I'm looking forward to working with you all. We are too. I concur. Thank you. Okay, Carol, I'm passing it on to you. Uh, okay, so the next thing that is up is we have, I don't know if anybody had a chance to look at it, in the middle of the afternoon sometime, uh, Nate sent out uh, an initial draft from that he, I guess he and uh, Dave, I don't think Dave is going to be here, is he? I think it's just you, Nate, that get to present this to us. I don't, at least don't see Dave here. No, he's at, uh, there's, uh, a, there's, there's a few other meetings tonight. That's where he and Paul Yeah, I are. know. So, yeah. so we have a... We talked last time about maybe having a, a job description. So Nate maybe wants to make an initial presentation. I, I, I'll just say at the outset, I'm, I at least am certainly not ready to vote on this. Among other things, there's no budget, which was the other piece of what we wanted to see. And we haven't had very much time to look at it, but I would love to hear whatever Nate has to say as just a presentation of this, how it's going, what he, what, what he thought, and anyone else's input on what they think of this as a possibility. So go Nate. Sure. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I sent it around, you know, it was a little late. The um, Chris Prestrup planning director also worked on it. So really, you know, the, the way we had hired people before, we would have a contract and, you know, one or two lines about scope of work and then some bullet points. And really, it has to be a town employee the way we're, the way it's meant to be now. Um, and the way we'd hire, say, someone like Rita now could no longer be necessarily a contract but an employee. So we wrote this as an employee job description with a few different parts. You know, uh, Carol and Erica did forward a number of bullet points that were incorporated into the responsibilities. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, there's some questions about how many hours per week. You know, right now I think we said 20 to 25, non-benefited for up to three years. So it's, the idea would be that it could be, you know, it might be more, maybe it's 30 hours a week, depending on funding. You know, there could be some discussion about whether or not we'd want to be benefited, you know, CPA voted $100,000 for three years. So about 30,000 a year um, for three years, you know, for a total of three years. And, uh, you know, Dave and I thought we met with Erica and Carol and we said, oh, well, if Rita's not under contract with the trust, could some of that money be used to support this position? In part, because we, I asked Rita and I reached out to a few other um, consultants in the area and with just the CPA money alone, it's almost hard to get someone who has that time in their schedule who can almost be full time or part time, but not really. And uh, you know, and we're it's it's still a lot of hours, but if we want it to be so many hours every day, it just might not fit into a schedule. And so, the hope would be that we could make the position, you know, as close to full time or you know substantial enough that there'd be interest. Uh, from someone, you know, when I hired Rita, we had to see quotes and I asked a few other people in the area and in Eastern Mass and no one was, no one really, 
you know, for what we were asking for Rita to do, no one was, um, was too interested just because of the, you know, it wasn't quite a part-time job. So anyways, the descriptions are really, they, I, I'd be one of the supervisors, um, you know, we'd work through the trust. And so any direction the trust would have, they would attend trust meetings. And under the responsibilities, we list about 13 items. I mean, it's, you know, a number of things, anywhere from doing research to helping set up forums, taking minutes, uh, working with developers, helping with permitting on projects, looking at uh, sites for possible housing, researching housing strategies. I mean, we throw a lot in there. And then we say anything else as assigned. And so <laughs> it's kind of like, here's a list of a lot of things. And if there's other things we, we think of, uh, that's that can be your responsibility. Um, you know, we'd love to have someone who has some experience with planning or housing and is familiar with it. Uh, you know, really it's to try to get projects going, right? So, you know, like for instance, like Strong Street, either help get projects going and see projects through. Um, you know, the trust has also talked about, could there be a local voucher program or could we have some other programs? And maybe this position can really then run with that and research it and present that. Uh, could we get information um, online, whether it's through multimedia or having educational pamphlets or guidance documents and you know, even coordinating with UMass or other organizations. And so just kind of pulling it all together. You know, the list is not a priority list. It's not in rank order. And so really, if, you know, as the trust members, when you review it, if you have comments, you can send it to myself and I can make changes to the document and send it back out and we can discuss it uh, next month. And so, like I said, it's not a priority list. If you think something's missing, you know, just throw a comment on it and send it to me. Um, you know, the job description, my job description, for instance, has like everything in there. Like I could be doing <laughs> any, anything really actually that I'm told to do. Um, <laughs> you know, staff 20 boards and, and more, and then it's really whatever, you know, is assigned to me. So I don't want to okay. overwhelm or make this position seem like more than it is. And so, yeah, I mean, just, I guess, have an eye for that too. Like, is this, are we being accurate in our description? Is there something else we really want to focus on? If, if there is, right. So if there is something we really want to focus on, maybe we highlight it as well. So, I, um, you know, I, I feel like it's pretty good. I mean, I, we're, we asked for some experience. Like I said, we list a lot of things. Um, we did capture most everything. I think Carol and Erica that you had recommended. Yeah. Yeah. I um, looked for those things. <laughs> I have a question. You said you would like, I mean, this says 20 to 25 hours. Mm -hmm. And then you said, well, we'd really like to get it up to 30 or almost full time. And I, is it, oh, can the town hire people for however many hours they want and still have it be non-benefited? Or is there some threshold when if you hire somebody for X, if this is an employee who's going to work 30 hours, they have to be, I mean, isn't there some thing like that that happens at some threshold point? Yeah, I, I don't know, actually. <clears throat> it's a really good question. So, you know, I, I said, I don't know how many hours it is. You know, we know CPA is 30,000 a year. And if the trust, say, for instance, was willing to put in 15 or 20,000, so then we could say, okay, well, we have, say, 50,000 if it's 20,000 a year. What, you know, what do we think that is in terms of an hourly rate or hours per week? And so that could become a discussion. So if we say, okay, the trust is willing to put in 20,000, what is 50,000 a year? Um, and then if the, you know, and then it is, it would, it'll become a discussion with HR about how this is classified. So we have to, to make it a town employee, we have to put it on a classification plan and, you know, get it approved through human resource, human resources. And so, you know, the first step would be to refine this position description and then meet with HR to determine where it, you know, how we can get it into the town's kind of classification plan. So yeah, I mean, you know, if we okay, think 50,000 is 30 hours a week and if we want it to be benefited, you know, I don't, you know, I don't know. I mean, that's a discussion to have. Like, is it, you know, we, when we presented to CPA, we were thinking 30,000 a year, maybe it wouldn't even be that much. And so then we said non-benefited because it was, you know, it was actually going to be like exactly. 20 hours a week at most. Well, my like my question is just how much discretion over whether it's benefited or not, do we really have? Because at least in any place I've ever worked, there's some point, if you work more than X hours a week, you must be benefited if you work more than, so I would just thought it would seem like it'd be helpful to know, maybe I'm wrong, maybe that's not true, but it's been true most any place I've been. And so 
be helpful to know if there's that kind of a requirement as we try to figure this out. Sure. Yeah, it doesn't really matter except for the for the money, I guess, but it seems like it'd be a useful thing to know and you can figure it out when you're figuring out your next draft. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it matters because, um, you know, the cost of health insurance and other things, you know, is a pretty big percentage exactly. of what a salary is, right? So it's like if, right. our, if our, if all the benefits is, you know, 35, 40% of what your salary is. So it's like, you know, if we have 50,000 a year and, you know, you figure out the math and really you only have, you know, 30,000 for salary because 20,000 is going to benefits. So. Yeah. That's why it would probably be good for us to know something about that as we try to, as, as we try to define it better. Mm -hmm. What if yeah, there's I, a, if there's a requirement, Erica, you look like you're about to talk. <clears throat> Yes. Um, so this is sort of the root of how some people who work in towns can't afford to live in towns. And so I'm a little concerned about, um, you know, what we're, what we're assuming is probably somebody who might have benefits through someone else and may be able to not have benefits, um, which limits your pool. Um, but I really think that I get the tension between wanting to find somebody and the uh, available, the available resources, but I don't want to be part of continuing a process of not paying people enough to be able to actually live in the town that they want to create housing, affordable housing for. Um, so um, I think we really Good should point. consider um, possibly maybe even getting other, other monies to make it a well-paid position. Um, you know, maybe there's some ARPA money, maybe there's some place else that we could have money. I know ARPA is only for a certain number of years, but I just really don't want to be part of underballing someone's, you know, living wage to, to then not even be able to live in the town that they're working for affordable housing. Yes, good points all. Thank you. <laughs> um, Nate, I, did I understand you said at the beginning that this could no longer be a consulting position? Yeah, the way we're writing it, it really, and the way um, the, I don't know if there's like, there's been a new ruling or something the auditors in the state have, there's, um, yeah, there's a, 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 a kind of a threshold test and this wouldn't really pass it. So it needs to be considered a town employee. Yeah, the attorney general has made a ruling about contractors. Um, and so there are three points of that ruling because we're, we're dealing with a lot of other municipalities around contract versus full-time employees. So if it's the direct supervision of the town and the tasks are specific, you know, very specific to what the town wants, then they have to be an employee, not a contractor. Okay. Yeah, I think a lot of towns, you know, I don't know if there wasn't just guidance, but everyone was doing it differently, you know, just a year or two ago. So this could have been a consultant or a contractor and then it changed pretty dramatically. I mean, maybe it should always have been, but my understanding was that it, there was clarification like a year and a half ago. Um, Ashley? Can I just, and maybe it's already in there, but to the part where they research different models of affordable housing that are things that we're not doing, I think is very important because we, we need some new ideas and some new ways of doing things that are also cheaper. And so hopefully they will do the research part quite a bit. That's all I'm saying. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, uh, well, does anybody have anything else to say? I mean, we're all we're sort of looking at this for the first time. It's going to go back to Nate and Dave, and just, any yeah, of I, us can provide any. Go ahead, Sid. I wanted to second um, Erica's point around you know um, having a salary and maybe you know also. Uh, you know benefits because then that also would attract more of a diverse pool right of, of folks and also maybe even single parents who um may not have that partner that that has the the insurance so if you can look at something that can pay folks um a way just like Eric said to live in town but also to provide them with um you know the health insurance and all this other stuff i think then we can attract more of a diverse pool of people uh, that we can choose from. Um, so I just wanted to re-emphasize the point because I thought it was a great point. Rob. Um, could, in, in order to um, raise enough money to fund this, could, could uh, outside sources contribute? 
do we fundraise or I'm specifically thinking of the Irish Community Land Trust. We contribute to the pool of money that that funds this position in exchange for you know some duties. Yeah, I, 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 I let me say there's one hand in our audience who seems to have something they might want to say about this. I'd like to I'd like to let uh, it's Laura. I'd like to let Laura Baker say what she wants to say, and then we'll see where we go from there. Laura? Yeah, I'm just going to answer Rob's question. I think you know, this would be a town employee, so I'm not sure we'd have fold-in responsibilities to Amherst Cooney Land Trust. I think there could be donations through the trust to help fund this. I do think right as if there were to become a full-time salary position, uh, it would be more than what we have. So I think sometimes, you know, uh, the town doesn't have a budget for this right now. So it really is just the CPA money. And we thought there's synergy working with the trust. And so, you know, if this were to have benefits and increase the position, it does, it could change the, you know, the kind of the scale of this. Um, and so we'd have to, you know, I'd have to talk to Dave and see what he was thinking, um, you know, but I, I understand what you're all saying. I just, you know, right now there may not be the, the budget for it. Um, this isn't like a, this wasn't something, this isn't part of the town budget. This is something we're kind of creating using, you know, CPA and trust funds. And if there are other, right, other fundraising, um, but well, maybe Laura. Laura, let Laura say whatever she wants to say. Hi, Hi Laura. Hi. Um, I basically wanted to say what Erica said. I think that, you know, when you find yourself trying to create an unbenefited position in your role as the affordable housing trust, there's something, there's a disconnect happening. Um, and I would strongly encourage folks to think about that and look at a way to add responsibilities or combine this. I know there's some vacancies in the planning department, you know, just to, to make it a livable wage for someone, you will get more value for your money. Um, mm -hmm. If you have a dedicated staff member than you will with a consultant. Um, and if you have, uh, a livable wage and benefits, then you'll have a much greater selection of candidates. So I, I'm echoing what other people are saying. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Well, I think I'm um, maybe, uh, go ahead, Ashley, and then I'll say what I was going to say. Well, I, I know I keep forgetting the details of this, but CPA money, that is not our $300,000 that maybe we could take just from our fund and we could give like 50,000, what if we took some of the money and gave more money, is that possible? We, uh, there's nothing that says we can. I mean, that's what we're exploring is what do okay. we want to do? How do we get what we want to get? And, um, and I guess one of the things I'm hearing is we don't want to participate in making low wage jobs so people can't live here. That's not what we want to do. So I think we're saying, one of the things we're saying to Nate, who just, disappeared or anyway oh no they're in the middle i can't see them anymore <laughs> um one of the things we're saying to nate and dave is make this a full-fledged benefit position what do you need to do that make yeah. it that and bring it back but that's what we want it to be and we'll figure out what to do but we want to see what that looks like and i think that's that, true. how much it costs and how much money we need each person needs how to much today us maybe the environmental people maybe we need to pool our resources right i don't even know how we can get there exactly because as she said if it's a town position it has to be part of the town but i don't know how we get there but we ought to at least know what we're trying to get to that's what i'm saying <laughs> risha <Yeah. laughs> so i i have a slightly different perspective and it's um we're doing some hiring in my other job and people are really looking for flexibility right now um, and so I'm not, I'm not hundred percent on that. This needs to be a full-time job. If there's a way to have a living wage, either that's why I asked about consultant, cause you can just make the wage a lot bigger so they can pay for benefits out of that or a part-time person with benefits. Um, and, and so I don't know what the flexibility around that is, but not everyone's looking for full-time jobs, um, particularly with everything that's happened in, um, childcare and, and, um, COVID. So I, I don't necessarily think we need to make it a full-time job if that's not, if we're forcing that. And if that's going to be a problem for our budget, I would just like that it's a real livable wage with either benefits in, included 
or that the wage goes up so much so that the benefits are part of that daily wage. Okay, is there, is it, Laura, have you still got something else to say? Your hand is still up, I'm not sure. Our hand is down, okay. Um, is there any, I think all we're, we're, there's nothing really, I don't think to vote on here exactly. We're just trying to provide feedback to Nate and to Dave who are trying to create this, uh, this description of a position. They have money from CPAC to use and they're hoping that we will use some of the money that we have to put together. We don't quite really yet know what we're looking at. So we're gonna keep trying to look at it. And I think Nate, Denny, do you have some idea of what kinds of things, where to go from here? Some of the things that we have thought about not that we've all thought the same thing even, but. Yeah, no, I mean, like I said, if you have any comments about specific responsibilities or, you know, priorities for the job, send them to me. Yeah, no, I think it's been a good discussion. It's interesting, right? Like how, how do we frame this? And so, um, yeah, I, I think that's, I, I think I'll, I'll need to talk to Dave and, you know, HR too about that. Like, so can we, you know, if we have the description and it says part-time or full-time, you know, can we have that flexibility in terms of how we advertise it or how do we go about the hiring process? So if it were, you know, if we're going out for a consulting um, contract, it would be different. But as a, an employee, you know, I'm not, I don't know if we can have that range in terms of how we hire someone. And I understand, Risha, what you were saying and what, what everyone else is saying. So, I don't, you know, I'm, I don't know. I'm curious to talk to HR and see what, what, what they think, too. Um, yeah, so no, I, I think, yeah, next meeting, if you have comments, we can come back um, and I can have some more information too about, you know, say cost of benefits and everything else. Okay, great. Well, then if no one objects, I would like to move on. We have a couple of updates that we're going to try to do in the next 10-ish minutes because we told Mandy Joe, I see that Mandy Joe and Patricia are both here and we told them that they could come on at about eight. So we have about 10 minutes for an update from Laura on um, East Gables. And then I have a very brief update just from an email that was sent to me about from Wayfinders about Beltertown Road. But Laura, since you're live, why don't you go <laughs> first? <laughs> Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, I can give you an update on our progress at East Gables. I hope that folks have had a chance to drive by and see the property. I know... Many people are desperately avoiding the, the road work uh, in that section of town, but we think it's turning out to be a very attractive and kind of handsome building that's going to fit well in its environment. Um, we're uh, moving along very well, given the construction environment uh, around us. Uh, we're at a stage where we're doing uh, rough mechanicals on the interior, be moving to drywall shortly. Would love to do a tour for the trust. Um, Carol and I went back and forth about timing and thought that maybe when the weather's a little milder and things are a little further along, it would be a more fun tour to do. Um, so we'd like to have you come on site and, and take a look around. Um, so generally good progress. We are spending a lot of care and time and discussion around the passive house requirements, which is an energy efficiency code. Um, we're doing things that are new to us um, to get you know, we have about a 10 or 12 inch thick building envelope. We have 10 inch thick doors. It's pretty crazy, um, but we're excited about that aspect. It's also our first all electric utility building. So there's a big learning curve for all of us um, and, and interesting in a, in a wonky technical kind of way. Um, did, you, did you send a picture, sorry, of the 10 inch thick door? I'm kind of curious. Yeah, when it comes on site, <laughs> it's, 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 it's amazing. Drawings. But I'm like, whoa, you know, it's it's partly a function of it's a relatively small multifamily building. Um, and so it is highly sensitive to fluctuations in temperature. Um, so to be very precise. Um, the other thing we're uh, thinking a lot about is the upcoming uh, marketing and lottery process. So our schedule calls for us to begin that lottery um, advertising, the affirmative fair marketing at the end of February, moving into March. So you will be hearing more about that aspect, which is exciting of people actually having the opportunity to fill out applications um, and hopefully move in. Uh, one of the decisions that we made um, that I'm, I feel good about is we're doing a very simple 
uh, pre kind of pre-application for people to participate in the lottery. So it's kind of a two-pager, um, trying to make it intentionally a very low threshold for folks to apply. Um, people may recall we have 10 units that have a homeless preference um, for tenants in this building. Um, and, you know, if you've ever tried to fill out a, a, an affordable housing application before, they're pretty onerous. I mean, many, you know, 10, 12, 14 pages of documentation. And it, it really is a barrier, in my view, for people to apply. So the process that we're going to use is people put in something that's fairly simple. We give them a preliminary screening look to see if they seem to be eligible. They go in the lottery. If they pop up toward the top of the lottery, then we're going to dig deeper in terms of all the things that we're going to look for uh, in terms of income eligibility and screening for tenants. Um, a reminder that we have a local preference requirement um, uh, put upon this project as part of the permitting. Um, and so there will be a preference for Amherst residents uh, as part of this marketing and selection process. Um, another kind of just interesting uh, point of information, I was approached last week by several uh, professors from Amherst College who are doing a course on kind of climate justice, basically climate change, the intersection of climate change with social justice. Um, and so we'll be doing a tour for their class uh, in March to come and look at the building and talk about some of the issues around, um, you know, how climate impacts are felt disproportionately by some groups um, and just looking at again, the wonky technical aspects of this particular construction. So I, I'm excited about that. I think it's kind of a cool learning opportunity. You know, we are right against, smack dab against the campus. Um, and so I, I'm also meeting with someone from, from the school to think of other ways that we might integrate into the curriculum at Amherst College, um, which is something we had always hoped um, would be possible. So it's all good. It all sounds great. Hey, do you guys have questions for me? What do you think about Murphy beds? Thumbs up or thumbs down? Yeah. <laughs> are you? Do you have them in those units? I didn't think you did. Are you just asking or? I'm asking. So the units are pretty small. Um, and so as I walk around them, I'm, I'm thinking a little bit more about modular furniture. So I'm kind of half joking, but. Yeah, the, the new mark, I mean, a market rate development on Spring Street, you know, behind the police station, they. Yeah. Um, a number of them have Murphy beds. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, without getting too into Murphy beds, <laughs> um, <laughs> Laura, I think, does anybody have anything else to say to Laura? I'm looking forward to our tour, Laura. So we're going to hold you to having it sometime yes. in the spring. Yes, yes, yes. I'm really psyched. I'm really psyched to see the place, including the 10 inch doors. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much for being here. Of thank course. you for participating in our in our uh, meeting earlier and giving us your your input on the position as well. Sure. Um, so let me just say the couple of sentences I have about can say about Belchertown Road, I can tell you that they have done a bunch of things. I'm not gonna read the whole list. I'll forward the email if people wanna see it. Uh, they got $400,000 in the CPA round as long as the town council approves that piece of it. Um, they are still looking at 72 units, 29 at Southeast Street, 43 at Belchertown Road. They are doing all the civil, all the things that they're supposed to do. And the bottom line being, uh, because they are working so hard, they still anticipate submitting the project eligibility letter to DHCD in the spring so that the project will move forward on the uh, expected or hoped for timeline. Um, they had something or other, they were going to, they were kind of planning to be here tonight, but something came up and they couldn't. And so I can, I'll send this out. Uh, I'll send this, I'll forward this email that, who did it go to? It went to Eric, went to me, I guess. And then anyway, and also to Erica. So I will forward this. So anybody who wants to see the kind of details of what they've done, but the, but the main thing is they're on track as they should be. There isn't really anything to see yet. They're just still checking out the soil and the wetlands and the da 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 all that kind of stuff that they have to do, but they're on track. So that's the good news. Um, 
if anybody has any questions, probably I can't answer them, but you can try asking and I can pass them on if somebody has a question. Okay, well then I think we are coming out really close to right on time. We are now gonna hear from Mandy, Joe and Patricia and invite them into the room to tell us what they're planning to do for affordable housing by changing some zoning laws. Mandy, Joe, and Pat. As, as we join, I wanna say thank you for having us and for inviting us to, to do this. Um, yeah. There's Pat. Um, I think I'm going to do the bulk of the presenting today, um, but Pat will be here to say a couple words too. Um, I don't know whether oh, Pat, you want to start. <laughs> Two words. Um, you have the presentation that I gave to the planning board. Um, I'm going to share my screen if I can, but I'm not going to go through. You're going to see a lot of swipes quickly across stuff because it takes about a half an hour to go through the whole thing. And I'm going to trust that you've read it all, but it helps to see some visuals as we talk about some of this. Um, so let's see if I can share my screen to, um, is there a way it can, I, it said it was disabled, so. Um, Nate's gonna have to give you the ability to do that, I'm sure. Okay. Can you Nate, do that, Nate? No, it's done, okay. Okay. So now you can all see the, the front side. And I'm going to spend more time on um, our, a little bit more time on our, our, our goals and then, and then go through some of the changes quickly because, because it goes through that. Um, let's see. Different program. Okay. So um, what, what did we, what are we trying to accomplish? We're trying to accomplish a, a, a couple of different things, um, equity and housing. And this is one where um, right now we have some sections of town um, or many of our residential sections have only one type of housing that is allowed to be built fully as of right. And I say fully meaning by submitting your building plans to the building commissioner and the building commissioner uh, granting a building permit without any public hearings or any um, other requirements other than the zoning bylaw itself and meeting the bylaw. And we would like to eliminate um, that policy that our bylaw has adopted sort of and say, you know, we want to allow more types of buildings, particularly duplexes and two types of the three duplexes that are mentioned in our bylaw to be permitted in the same way a single family home is, which is just going to the building commissioner and saying, here are my plans. It meets the zoning bylaw, grant me a building permit um, so that I can start building it. Um, we believe this would help eliminate you know, won't eliminate it fully, but it's a pathway towards addressing our economic and social segregation. And it would also, because of the ones we've chosen, particularly the homeowner, uh, uh, owner occupied duplexes, create uh, multiple places for home ownership opportunities that might not be there right now. Um, we want to address the housing crisis, right? We have a lack of housing in town for the demand that we see in town, not just from those young individuals that are attending our colleges and universities, but from others that want to work and live um, and create a life here beyond their schooling life. Um, not doing anything isn't going to fix that problem. So we have to look at what can we do? That doesn't mean what we've proposed will fully do anything, right? This is just one spoke in many different ways we can address this crisis, but this is a way to, we hope, encourage more housing opportunities through these changes, encourage the building of more duplexes, encourage the building of more triplexes. Um, uh, you, you look at some stats from the um, mass, um, housing partnership, and we have many less duplexes than most communities in, in the state. Um, that is one area where we don't really meet 
the median of the state duplexes. We have a lot more apartments than most places in the states. We have a lot more five to nine unit buildings than in the state, but we don't have duplexes and many other places have a lot more duplexes on a percentage basis than we do. We're trying to create that those opportunities and make it um, that pathway easier to create those opportunities. We wanna improve sustainability. We know that, um, the, the more units that are within a building, the more sustainable the building is, not just within the heating, but, but as you do infill development and all, you have a more sustainable system. And then we're also trying to create some sort of logic to the use table. We tried to take some logic and say, you know, if, if this is a more intense use than some other use, then the permitting pathway should potentially be more intense. Oops, I can't swipe like I always intend to. I got to remember this. So I'm going <laughs> to not spend a lot of time on this. Um, but but one of our, our defining um, thoughts and questions as we went through this is we have four types of permits in town, one of which isn't really a permit. On our use table in the zoning bylaw, a no means you can't build it. You can't put it in town. So I wouldn't really call that a permit, but that's one of the four options. A yes, as I talked about, is you just go to the building commissioner and you can build it as long as it meets zoning requirements. We have exactly four types of yeses in the bylaw. Single family homes fall under that category. And then the other three are forestry, orchards, and conservation. So no other building types other than single family home get a yes in the bylaw. We're trying to eliminate that by adding some duplexes into that. Then we have site plan review and special permit. And what we as sponsors thought about was what's the difference between them and why do we want to preference site plan review? Well, special permits are discretionary. That means that when you, you put down that you need a special permit, what you're saying to the rest of the world and the developers and the community is, well, in that zone, whether that be the residential general or the residential village center or the commercial zone, we're not sure that the use, that that use is appropriate for that zone. It may be in some areas, it may not be in other areas. So we want to be able to say no. We want to be able to say no, you can't build that because it's not that that parcel you wanted to build it on is not an appropriate parcel. We want to say no in some instances and yes in some instances. Um, it's discretionary. It doesn't have to be. There's a lot more restrictions to that. The, the hearing notices come the same with the two. But with a site plan review, what we're saying is, you know what, in that zone, in that commercial zone, say, that commercial use is always appropriate in that zone, that we've zoned that area for a commercial use. And so we want a little bit of control over what it looks like. We want to be able to have some say. We want to have a review of it. But we know it's appropriate in that zone. So what we're saying, if we choose between special permit and site plan review for certain residential developments and building uses is saying, right now we have special permits for many of our duplexes, um, particularly non-owner occupied duplexes. But what we're saying when we've chosen special permit is those duplexes aren't always appropriate in that zone. So you have to look at the zoning map and, and compare what, what your permitting pathway is to where that zone lives in town. And that's where I'm going to go through a lot of these slides quickly. We have five basic residential zones, low density to high density. Um, most of our density is controlled by our dimensional table, not our use table in terms of residential density, because our dimensional table by default says you have to have so many square feet to even start building one resident residents, one unit of residential housing. Um, and for each of the zones, then you have to have a certain number of square feet to go beyond that. And so this slide just says where we are just on that. No matter the type of housing use, you can't put more than certain numbers of buildings, units in these zones, and that's what that shows. So we've we've created that, quote, medium or high density or low density through the dimensional table, not necessarily through the use table. Um, I'm going to skip through some of these. I talked about that one. So let's talk about what we're trying to do. So with duplexes, these are some pictures from duplexes in town. They're two units. They each have separate entrances at the ground floor. They're either one on top of the other or one next to each other. And we are trying to say in the business zones, if they're 
appropriate for owner occupied and affordable, a non owner occupied is, is, is also appropriate. It's that question of is it always appropriate or suitable to build that use in that zone, or do we want to be able to say no to that use in that zone? This is where we're trying to eliminate that exclusionary zoning, um, that single family only zoning. We are proposing owner occupied and affordable duplexes to be yeses in the four, the five residential zones that we basically have, excluding the fraternity zone. We want to say, and we believe as sponsors, that an owner occupied duplex and an affordable duplex are always appropriate in all of our residential zones, just like a one family is always appropriate. Yes. Those duplexes should not have to go through public hearings to be built. That as long as they satisfy and meet the zoning requirements of our zoning bylaw, they can be built without public hearings. Non-owner occupied duplexes were again saying are suitable in all areas, but we want some say over the look, the some of those requirements, the lighting, some of these things, we want to be able to have some review of that. So, so we would propose moving them from that special permit where you can say, no, we don't want a duplex there to, we just want to look at it and have some control over it. The conditions here are some of the conditions that we've proposed um, for them. Uh, many of them match the ADU conditions that we recently enacted. Um, for additional accessory dwelling units. So triplexes, this is an interesting thing. Um, right now, triplexes, if you wanna build a three family unit, you either build a townhome, one next to each other, or you build an apartment building. And so if you want a three family, what we would typically call a triplex, a up down vertical sort of building of a three family, it's technically an apartment building. And so you have to comply with all of the apartment building language. What we're trying to do is separate that out from apartment buildings and say triplexes are kind of close to duplexes. They shouldn't be considered apartment buildings on the same scale as a 24 unit building or a 10 unit building. They should be their own category. They're a typical type of use. So we have a definition and all of that. And, and since it would be a new use, you have to put them in all in. This one matches the commercial districts matches everyone else. The rest of the business districts were matching with duplexes because we believe they're closer to duplexes than to others. And so we would only allow them to be built in this proposal in the BN district, just like the duplexes. In the residential areas, again, what we're saying is they're appropriate in all residential areas that a three family is appropriate, but we want some review. This chart shows some of the minimum lot sizes to get to that third, again, talking about, well, is this going to create huge amounts of density in some of our low dense areas? Well, to get to, to build a three family in our lowest density area, you need two and a half acres, um, which is one oh. of the reasons we believe it is always appropriate is because you need two and a half acres and that still seems very low density to us. Um, the conditions match basically all of the duplex conditions that we've proposed match that mostly the ADU conditions and all of that. Um, because it's a new use and a new use category, it comes with changes to these other sections to add triplexes as permitted uses similar to duplexes. So basically we said, where are duplexes mentioned? And we added triplexes into that mention. Townhouses. These can be three to 10, they're next to each other and they always have separate entrances on the ground level for each of the units. Um, we're proposing a couple of different changes in the BN, the, the business areas. One is to actually make it harder to permit and that's in our general, business general. Um, to match the apartment, we want to, in our densest business area, we want to actually encourage commercial retail um, a little less of the housing unless it's a mixed use building. And so we, we thought we'd match what we did with apartments recently on the council. Um, on the all the other areas, we want to say, you know, a townhouse that's eight, nine, 10 units is actually really appropriate for our business neighborhood district that's really tiny. It's really appropriate for the BVC. And so we want to allow it with that site plan review, again, public hearing and all of that. 
In the residence neighborhoods, this is where I split some out. Um, in our densest, the medium and medium to high, the, the ones closest to the village centers, closest to our downtown areas, we believe it's entirely appropriate to build a, a have a townhouse. And so we're proposing moving from special permit where they could be denied to site plan review where we still have some control but are, are saying that they're suitable. The residence neighborhood zone, which is a little farther outlying, still only medium density, Right now, they're not allowed at all. And what we're saying here by changing it from a no to a special permit is, you know, in some parts of that RN, they probably are appropriate. You know, the RN, despite the fact that you see that apartments aren't allowed, the RN is where Puffton is located. It's where Branding Wine is located. It's where Townhouse is located. It's where um, all of those um, East Hadley Road apartments um, are located. And so we're, when looking at it from that point of view of what is already in our RN. If we've already got all these apartment complexes and we already have a lot of single family homes, we believe townhouses in certain parts of that district should be allowed. And right now they're not allowed anywhere. And so changing to special permit doesn't mean we're going to find townhouses everywhere because it's still discretionary, but we think we should allow them. Similarly, in the RO and RLD, we're proposing a special permit not because we think necessarily that the RLD category should have 10 unit townhouses in it potentially, but because some of the RO categories are near, some of that RO zone is near a village center. I put a picture on here from um, the Long Meadow Drive area, the Glendale Road, Orchard Valley, right next to our Pomeroy Village Center. And maybe, and I'm just saying maybe, that area could house some townhouses that it, we might be able to say it's appropriate in some of those areas. In other areas of the RO and RLD, probably not appropriate, but we don't wanna eliminate the possibility in some areas that are already close to village centers. And so, you know, while this area might be even more limited in where a townhouse should go, and we would be relying on the ZBA to make those determinations and trusting them that they would, we, we need to look at and say, but there are some areas, so let's not eliminate the possibility completely. The conditions we're not proposing changes to. Converted dwellings are an interesting thing. And so I just want to talk about what they are. These are reuses. These are buildings that already exist and already have a residential unit in it that a person that owns it wants to add more residential units to that building. Um, there are strict limits already in the bylaw about how much of the of new construction there can be. There's strict limits that say no new dwelling unit can be of new construction alone. And there are even dwelling unit number restrictions in the residential zones. You can only convert up to four units in the converted dwelling. In the business zones, you can only have six. So in some sense, these are less intense uses than um, townhouses even because you can't go above four in a residence and a six in there. And you've already got the building there. So what do they do? They really promote that infill development, that reuse of historic buildings or non-historic buildings, just buildings in general that might be too big for one residence right now that we want to maybe divide up and make a little more affordable for everyone else. It promotes that diversity of housing types and bringing in that economic diversity into neighborhoods that might have lots of large buildings or lots of, lots of that. So we're again proposing to mostly take these to site plan review in all of the districts um, because of those reasons. This talks a little bit more about what RN is, um, even though I talked about it in the townhouse sections. Conditions, um, oh, let me go back to conditions. Conditions, this just talks about what we're retaining, adding or deleting. I can talk more about it. The management plans would not actually be deleted. They would be deleted from this these sets of conditions because they would be covered under other conditions. Because one of the things we're saying is converting a dwelling is more of a development type versus an end use. If you go from one to two in a building that has two separate entrances at ground floor, well, once you're done that conversion, it's really a duplex. So let's require the duplex conditions for that building. You know, if you actually go from one to four units and those four units have one entrance and then from that ground floor entrance, you have four interior entrances. well, you're really building an apartment complex. Well, let's require the apartment complex conditions. And most of those conditions all require management plans. And so we're not deleting those management plan requirements at all. We're just moving how we refer to them. 
So this is an interesting district, and this is one we haven't changed too much. This is to protect our aquifer in the Lawrence Swamp. And so this is when you look at the zoning use table and you see all these parentheses, what does it mean? Well, that means anything in the right recharge protection district. And so this is where we're saying townhouses are probably not appropriate in those districts because a townhouse might be too intensive a use, especially if you're on sewer when we're trying to make sure we don't harm our water supply. Um, converted dwellings, depending on the size, we need to make sure they're on sewer, that they're not on septic. And so if they're only two or three, there might be appropriate, but maybe if they're four and they're really close to that swamp or that drainage, maybe we don't want them there. And so we're, we're proposing special permits, but for duplexes and triplexes, we're saying they're still appropriate. We can manage that within the aquifer recharge protection district. So they'd be site plan review in those districts. Subdividable dwellings is all I have to say is this, is the building commissioner recommended we delete it. So we're proposing deletion. It's been used once. And I believe that is all for my presentation. Um, I hope I kept it somewhat shorter than normal <laughs> and that we're happy to answer any questions. And Pat may want to say a few words, I don't know. No, I'm, um, I'm recovering from some surgery. So I'm here because I so support your work and Mandy's work. She's really lifted this and carried it and I appreciate it. If something comes up, I will, that I think I have something really important to say, I will say it, but. Um, thank you for inviting us. Um, I have I have at least one question, probably more than one question, but my question of greatest curiosity is to get this passed, does it take three quarters or half of the town council? Because I thought I read that the governor did something so that various kinds of zoning laws now had to had only to have a regular majority to pass. And so I'm very curious about that. So um, we won't know until we get an actual legal opinion. Um, but uh -huh. I in, in reading some and it's a new law and you are correct, there are certain types of zoning changes that now only need a majority. So on the council, that would be seven. And there are other types that still remain needing the nine, the two thirds, um, which is nine on on our body. Um, the types of zoning changes that only need seven um, have to be um, they, they need to be increasing the ability to add units on any parcel. And nearly all of our changes do that. There's that one, um, it, not, not add units, but increasing the ease of adding units. So, so moving up that one permitting pathway, going from no to special permit or going from special permit to site plan review. Um, only one of our proposed changes does not meet that requirement. And that is that one business general um, townhomes moving, I think it was townhomes, moving from um, site plan review to special permit. So that one would definitely need nine because it's it doesn't meet that initial requirement. The next requirement is that they be in a qualified zone. And this is where you need the attorney opinion more than I can say as to whether it meets <laughs> that qualified zone. Okay. Those zones are generally um, already multifamily zones or zones, so they already allow some multifamily housing, but places where the infrastructure, the um, and I, I could look it up if you give me about a minute, but I don't have those those languages right available. But it's infrastructure. It's um, places where there's already multifamily housing on major, you know, through fares, on bus routes, on other transportation routes and all of that. And so what I don't know is whether certain of our zones qualify or not. Um, we are we believe that some of the changes will qualify for seven votes. We just don't know where that will come down. Um, you know, for example, the mixed use building changes that we made um, as a council a couple years ago were was a seven vote voting requirement, not a nine vote. And so I think it we just need to wait and see, but we believe at least some of the changes will require just seven. Thank you. Um, other people have other questions? I have a question, and oh, sorry, Ashley, you had your hand up. Well, oh, I was just going to say, if I'm not mistaken, this is actually kind of what the state of California did. It it basically 
just made no single family housing zones, period. And so maybe we could also just check at some point if the governor could do it. I mean, if that's maybe part of the plan, it would be really helpful if it was statewide, that there was no necessary to be single um, family zoning. Just that way. Thanks. Um, Allegra. Um, I wanted to say thank you for kind of thinking creatively about different ways to get different types of housing in. Um, I'm just wondering if you could speak a little bit more to how um, how affordable housing will be preserved in this, because my concern is that we'll just see a bunch of triple deckers popping around that now there are 12 beds that will be going for like $2,000 a pop at this point. Um, and I understand that students are a population that also need housing. I just worry that there will be, the affordability piece will be lost. And I, I just wanted to hear a little bit more about that. Um, you know, we obviously can't guarantee if these changes go through that anything gets built, right? Um, as I stated, we're trying to encourage more building and, and create more opportunities. The one thing I would point to is the fact that we have put for that affordable duplexes, as well as the homeowner occupied ones that we've made them the yeses. Those are the ones we want to make the easiest to build. Um, meaning no public hearings, just you comply with the bylaw, you get your building permit, just like a single family home. Um, and so the, the one thing I could say is with that change, we are hopeful that more people would build the affordable duplex or the owner occupied duplex. Um, and, and if it's an owner occupied duplex, you know, the hope is that we, we've heard, we've heard um, stories I don't know if there's research out there or any statistics out there, but we have heard that those who um, own a duplex and tend to live in one side and potentially rent the other side tend to sort of have lower rents than those that are renting both and really have it as an investment opportunity. We don't know, right? But um, that's, that's sort of where this proposal is hoping to really encourage that affordable side. Um, triplexes, we, we haven't put in different categories of triplexes. It was something we talked about, Pat and I, in terms of meeting, you know, doing the same thing that duplexes have done with triplexes. We could consider that where you've got an owner occupied one that has an easier permitting pathway and an affordable one that has an easier permitting pathway than a non-owner occupied one to also help encourage that. Um, if that is something that people would be interested in, we could certainly consider something like that. I mean, just to follow up, I think that would be a good idea. I mean, I just kind of anecdotally in some of the areas that I worked in in Boston, it was very typical of like multi-generational multi families living, you know, on the various floors in a triple decker. And right. that could be a way to, you know, you're not hopefully going to charge your grandma <laughs> a lot of friends. It's, <laughs> it's also but. clearly cheaper to buy land to build a duplex and what we're seeing with younger people and also some older friends of ours who are more our age who have bought property together and build a duplex and they're smaller than um, the single family home might have been but they're more sustainable um, in terms of energy usage etc but what we're seeing is a desire for pe younger people to be raising families together Mm -hmm. uh, and then aging in place. And that's a trend nationally, not just in Massachusetts. It's an important trend. Rob. You're muted, Rob. Sorry about that. I, I, I um, agree with Allegra's concern about uh, what this does to affordability. I, I don't. I um I agree that affordable duplexes and non and owner occupied duplexes should be yeses. That makes a lot of sense. Um, I don't think that you promote affordable housing by promoting non owner occupied duplexes. It's a fantasy to think that people will build them and and rent them rent both sides to families. I I just don't think that's going to happen. 
So, so I don't see any need to, to promote that now. Mm. Let's take it one step first and, and make um, affordable and, and owner-occupied um, easier to do. I also like the idea of making triplexes a, a thing, a, a thing that is possible. Um, I would like to see that also separated into affordable and owner-occupied and, and non-owner-occupied as two different permitting paths. I don't see any problem in keeping those uh, non-owner-occupied uses as site plan review or as, as special permit. It, it's, you know, it's, it's a good, it's good that they are more expensive and, and, and harder to get through. Uh, and I one um, last concern about um, the BN district. You mentioned that it's that where they exist, they're tiny. And I don't see, I, I, I believe that those districts are, are meant to encourage businesses to coexist with housing. But if you make housing too easy in those districts, then they're going to crowd out any any business opportunity. So I would not uh, lessen the the permitting um, burden in for housing in those districts. Thank you. Any other comments or questions or concerns, Erica? I was more curious about timelines and how we can support you. Thank you. Yeah, so the the next step, sort of the next formal steps are the public hearings at both the planning board and the community resources committee. They're the mandated state public hearings. The planning board public hearing will begin at 635 on March 1st. Um, and the CRC public hearing will be 435. So 430 and 630 are when the meetings start. So 430 on March 2nd for the community resources committee public hearing. Um, we suspect that neither hearing will be closed at its first date um, because we know there's a lot of concern. We know there's a lot of work to be done and potentially compromise, including some of the stuff you've said here about changes to make it right for Amherst. Um, but so so thoughts to both of those committees on on the stuff that you've um, and some of the concerns, but also some of the supports you've indicated tonight to those committees in advance of those hearings or at those hearings um, is is the first step of doing it. And then when it finally moves out of the committees back to the council um, in whatever manner it looks like at that time, um, then then communication with the council um, would certainly be helpful. Thank you. Um, any other comments or I don't know if there's anything to take a vote on, but I'd like at least kind of a straw. Do people do, do the people on the trust think that this is generally given given some here and there we have to tweak things, but does this seem like it's going in the right direction? I'm just liking for a, I don't know, some a, a general idea. Not I guess nobody you can't record thumbs, but um I'm I, I just like to hear. And anybody's like, are we he are they headed in the right direction? Are we headed in the right direction here, Ashley? Well, I just have a question, probably for Nate. But the way that an apartment complex like North Square Apartments, um, there, you know, the incentive for that developer to have ten percent or more low income units is that applied to just about could be applied to anybody. So, like, if you have a house and you want to make units in it or you want to build a threeplex and you agree to have well it couldn't maybe it's 10 percent, maybe it's 20 percent, maybe more you get less on your you know taxes does that apply it doesn't so the you know the town has a local tax incentive but you have to have 10 units or more and then so you know for a smaller development it the tax incentive wouldn't. Um, however, you know, if if someone has an affordable unit that's deed restricted, it gets assessed differently by the town, so it would get, uh, you know, it'd be taxed less, and so, you know, it wouldn't have any incentive, but it would, you know, it still be, you know, it, it would have less taxes on it. So, oh, okay, 
just because yeah. if so it only applies to 10 or more units could maybe it could apply to less units at some point yeah that so it's an interesting idea probably not would not be uh in the realm of what this zoning thing is trying to do it's a whole different ball of wax but it's an interesting thought so keep it in mind <laughs> <laughs> uh so i does anybody have any any i mean i i i'll say for myself i think that uh working to break the hold of single family big lot development is a is great and i love the attention to detail that's involved in what you're doing because it seems like it's the way that it has to happen and so i personally at least feel very supportive and um just interested to hear what the other people on the on the trust feel also i, I mean my my two cents is yes absolutely want to get rid of single family zoning um generally the the duplex and true triplex is that the word um frightens me in amherst because of how how it seems like that's just a perfect setup for uh university housing um and so i would love to see actually more apartments and more uh, multi-unit townhouses you know where, where it is 10 or more and then we get affordable units as part of those and um versus a bunch of small duplexes that very quickly get rented out to students and don't really improve the housing for most of us and I don't have the answer uh if I did I'd suggest it and I think you're getting you're going in the right direction um but just that's my my concern anybody else want to say anything well go ahead Rob um you started you can go ahead I, I'm sorry I I I forgot to mention um townhouses your 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 um, work on townhouses that i'm i'm interested in 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 that concept of of allowing townhouses to spread to more zoning districts um i haven't thought fully about you know what what sort of the permitting path should be but but it but that is also an interesting idea so i did support at least thinking about that Yeah, I was just going to say, um, I agree with Risa. I think there's a, a certain level of tension of, you know, you hear the more stock, then there often will be more affordability, but there's no guarantee. And so I think, you know, some of the combination of what Rob was saying in terms of owner occupied is really important because it does give uh, individuals opportunity to actually have housing and create to some extent capital. And if it's correct that uh, if it's owner occupied and it's less it's more affordable and less higher rents, then that's an opportunity. Um, but there is this tension with, you know, duplex, triplex to ensure that, you know, they it, families who need affordable housing and who want to live in Amherst and you want that diversity actually have access to it. Um, not to say that students who want to create families and want to stay in Amherst shouldn't have that. If that's the opportunity, that's the pipeline, that's fine too. But too often, um, a lot of the apartments and homes that you see around here um, absolutely are filled with students. And, and I just had a quick question because I did see in there where it talked about, um, I believe the number of people within within one of these um, duplexes or triplexes, I believe it said four, but I was just wondering, does the town have any uh, limit in terms of person per square footage? um so i don't know about a person per square footage i actually think i read somewhere nate might be able to answer that that somewhere in the building code there might be a minimum square footage per occupant somewhere and that's how they determine occupancy limits um but nate might know that better um what the town has in is for unrelated individuals a maximum of four per dwelling unit no matter the size of the unit no matter how many building bedrooms um, but they have to be unrelated yeah the unrelated thing is is tricky to enforce and actually measure but in terms of 
you know, uh, building code. It's a, I think it's also the plumbing code is stricter in terms of minimum mm. square feet. And then if you're on septic, it's, you know, bedrooms and dev um, with the septic, you know, design of septic system. So, um, but there's really not, you know, any, you know, the unrelated is the only one, right? So in terms of a, how, how a dwelling unit could be occupied, you know, if it's overcrowded, the town, you know, could do something, but really it's, you know, like you could double up bedrooms, you know, families do, right? Have, you know, siblings and partners and bedrooms. So, it, you know, there really isn't, um, you know, unless you have a lot of people, I think the code is really small, right? The square foot per person is really small. I mean, the plumbing code might be like 150 square feet per person or something based on, you know, then fixtures or whatever. So it's, it's, it's it can actually be pretty dense. I don't, I don't think we're there. Anything else? I was going to say quickly, the planning board is having kind of the, a corollary conversation. Uh, I think it's in two weeks on Tuesday or next week on Tuesday. Gosh, I should know this. I think it's the 21st, 22nd, 21st, 21st, Tuesday the 21st. Um, it's an off cycle meeting for them, but to talk about where in town there could be denser housing, um, you know, specifically say, as Risha mentioned, you know, let's say just student housing, right? Where, do, uh, where can we put thousands of beds for students. I mean, that's really what we need. The housing study said it in 2015 and people were really angry at it. And the consultant was kind of unapologetic with how they presented information. But, you know, they really did say that there's, you know, a demand of thousands of beds for off-campus housing. And I feel like what we're seeing now is with, especially with the over-enrollment just recently, but there is a really kind of unsaturated demand for student housing. And so, I don't know if the chair of the planning board is really saying student housing, he's saying denser housing, right? Where is it appropriate in village centers or town center? But, you know, the UTAC report and the housing studies have said, you know, maybe around the university kind of what's happening on Mass Ave, can we allow for denser housing to try to get some of that demand, that student demand for housing in appropriate locations that can then, you know, get other, allow others to have, get into the housing market. And so it's something the chair I wanted to do for a while, but there is this meeting on the 21st that you know will be a public meeting and it actually will be in person. It's, it's gonna be a hybrid meeting. We're, we're thinking maybe in the town room and um, over Zoom, but you know, I think it's the planning board's you know, trying to have this conversation about right, where can we allow um, you know, density of housing? And I think, you know, I feel like both these proposals are you know, the same side, a different side of the same coin, right? Like we need to have, do both. We need to have a number of strategies and avenues. And I agree, I feel like we need to allow, um, you know, housing for, for all different types of people, but definitely students. I mean, I, I, I think that that's something that hasn't been addressed either very well in, in the zoning. Um, you know, we say apartments downtown and then it's students and maybe people think it won't be, but that's what's a driving force in the Amherst market. Amherst is really particular. So I feel like, you know, you go two towns over and it's a different housing market just because of the dynamics of, of who lives in Amherst and who wants to live in Amherst. Um, but yeah, so I, I, you know, I'd encourage people to attend that too as well. And, you know, it'll be recorded. So you can always watch later if you don't want to attend that night. I wish the town could find some way to have some um, leverage over the university to get them to house more of their students themselves and somewhere instead of instead of having them all sort of fall into Amherst and then not even in Amherst. I mean, I know stories of students who can't find anywhere to live either and have to live a zillion miles from where they're trying to go to school. Just not enough housing at all, period. Um, Anyway, anything anything else about this particular proposal that we've been hearing about? I just I guess I would then just say thank you to Mandy Joe and Pat and uh, we'll keep us keep us in your loop. So if there's a time when it's clear that there'd be something that you want from us that we haven't done or that we could do, uh, let us know and we'll try to keep up with what you're with how you're moving it forward. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you for having us and for the suggestions and comments you made. They're really helpful. Take care. Great. Um, let's see. So we have, oh, we have one other thing. I um, want to introduce or bring, or let me see what Ashley had to say first. I was just, I just wanted to reiterate and maybe just um, check 
So unless something has 10 units or more, we have no control or even influence over who lives there. Like a 10 and over has to have low income housing at some percent, 10% or ideally more. Under 10, we, we have nothing. We have, no, we have no influence. Is that true? Correct. I think that's right. I think that's the inclusionary zoning thing that we didn't even have it for over 10 until the, I don't think, until the inclusionary zoning change happened. Well, so it's not helping us to do less than 10 units. I mean, it's not helping, it's not helping us have some influence on 10% or more income, like, and we, it needs to be way more than 10% of low income units. A person with nine units can do whatever they want. They can just build it. Yes. Well, there are still other zoning requirements that they have to go through that don't include affordability. I don't really know exactly what they are, but from what all Mandy Joe and them just said, it's like they have special permits and different things that they have to, Nate could talk about it better than I can. Right, no, yeah, I mean, they still have to go through a permitting process, but there's no requirement for affordable units. I mean, they right. barely include them, they often don't. Um, and, you know, 10 was decided on because there's a cost, you know, there's a, a, you know, say lost revenue for affordable units, but then there's cost to build. And often that was said, that's a good ratio or number to start at 10. It could be something that is re-examined. And so, you know, Rob, to your comments, um, right. If, if, if we want to have triplexes or, you know, what if we even say there's a quadplex, you know, four units and then five and above is an apartment. Maybe we get, you know, there's different ways to think about it, but having a requirement that one of those units be affordable or owner occupied, and that might be site plan or view and the rest of special permit, then we could try that. You know, there's nothing saying we can't, we just, you know, when we had done the inclusionary zoning or when we've done the housing studies previously, the consultants would say, don't have a requirement for affordable units if it's less than 10, because it becomes, um, you know, burdensome or a financial hardship on the developer. And it could actually deter the development of them. Um, but, you know, I think it's something that is still worth exploring. So we haven't, you know, I, I kind of agree that if we put it in there, maybe, maybe we'll, you know, maybe it'll develop some housing. Um, maybe people will use it. it. It just feels to me like we want, you know, affordable owner occupied on one end and then 10 or more, like everything in between sort of doesn't get to what we're trying to, it, it meets different needs. And at some point, yes, we just need supply. And, you know, there, the theory is that eventually that balances everything out and we just don't have enough right now. But from an affo strictly affordable, that, that middle space is not all that attractive to us. But I, I, I don't think we should assume it's going to ever balance out. If you live in one floor and you've got two other places that you own, you might as well fill it with pretty wealthy students and and pay for your whole mortgage it's not there's no incentive for the homeowner to not build that three and then fill it with just totally unaffordable for almost everybody except for like a wealthy student you know kids like there's no incentive i don't know if that's true if it's my house i want people that i like and people that i get along with and people that are going to be there for a while and people that I want neighbors. I want neighbors in my house. I don't know. So I, I hear what you're saying, but I don't think it's quite that simple either. So. Yeah, I think it's nuanced, but I, yeah, I do think that a lot of, I think a lot more bedrooms would be rented by bedroom for students or someone who could afford, whether it's students, but someone who could afford a higher rent. And so, you know, there probably are some unintended consequences of that. Um, yeah, it's interesting the one to 10. I mean, it's also, um, you know, Valley CDC years ago did a strategic visioning for their plan, like five-year plan or whatever plan it was. And a lot of communities, you know, representatives from different communities in the area said, yeah, we'd love to see 10 to 20 unit developments that are affordable. And they said, well, you know, the tax credit programs and the subsidies don't fund those small developments. So, you know, it's going to be 40 or more for rental or you know, home ownership's hard. But it's interesting that everyone really likes the idea, right, of smaller developments they can fit in with the scale especially out in western mass but there really isn't a good mechanism to incentivize those or subsidize those and so 
you know, maybe the state, uh, maybe Maura Healy's housing plan can help address that. I agree, there is this kind of this missing piece or a few missing pieces maybe. And it is odd that we have, right, someone could do eight units and there's no really incentive or mechanism to try to get either lowercase or capital A affordable, right? There's just really not, it's actually at their discretion, you know, is it, does the developer want to just have, you know, different people living there and they artificially keep the rent low because they're nice? I don't. Well, one of the things that we agree that we need in order to do more affordable housing is more money to do it with. And that leads me to want to ask us to support again, we did last year to support the efforts of the it's called local options for affordable housing, that whole coalition of around the state that's trying to put through um, a state law that would allow municipalities to put a transfer fee on high end real estate and have that money go to affordable housing. We already went through this with the one Amherst has one that they're proposing. The Amherst proposal the main difference is that the the Amherst proposal would allow the money that's that is collected in this way to be in some way divided up between the housing trust and other needs of the town. What this huge coalition of people is trying to put through as a state law would allow any munis any municipality or town that has an affordable housing trust to create within these guidelines a similar kind of law. And it would it would let all the all the towns that want to be able to do it. There's a lot of towns already. There's what is there? Arlington, Boston, Brookline, Concord, Nantucket, Promise Town, Turo, Cambridge, Chatham, Wellfleet, and Somerville all have transfer fee home rule petitions, like the one Amherst is trying to propose. This would make it really easy for easier for any other town to do a similar kind of thing and get more money into the pots of all the towns in the state that are trying to create more affordable housing. And so, I don't know, I just wanna make us aware of this, hope that we will support it again. Um, it's being sponsored by Joe. Joe Comerford is behind it. Lindy Sampadosa, we have, we are asking, we could ask as the trust, if you're willing, we could ask Mindy Dom, our representative, I think she's in favor of it. She hasn't co-sponsored. She doesn't have co-sponsored it yet, or haven't hasn't said she would. Um, so I would like to see us agree to again support this. And basically, we've heard what it is because we heard about it from Amherst, and this is the same thing, but makes it possible for any town to do it. And the main difference is that in the general one, all of the money that's collected would go. To, for affordable housing. Um, do any trust members have any comments or questions before I ask John, whose hand is up to speak? Go, John. Uh, I sent a note uh, earlier today to Joe Comerford and Mindy Dom and, and their staffs, and also to uh, Carol and Erica, in which basically I asked them to support both the statewide uh, effort, which is what Carol's just been talking about, as well as the Amherst effort. Now, the Amherst uh, uh, special legislation is different in a number of respects from what the statewide legislation would be. Um, so it's like, well, do we have to support one and not the other? Do we have to stick with Amherst? And I think the answer to that is no. And that's what I said to both Mindy and Joe. We, we don't know actually what's going to happen. And it would be great if both the Amherst special provisions pass and the statewide provisions pass, because then that would have an impact potentially in many other towns. Um, so we really want both to happen, but I'd be happy with at least one because either gives us a path to get revenues for affordable housing that we don't now have. 
So I wrote my note. Uh, I obviously wasn't speaking on behalf of the housing trust, but I am endorsing what Carol proposes, which is that she or Eric or both of them send a, a communication to our state senator and our state rep saying, to Joe, thanks for initiating this and sponsoring it. And to Mindy, it would be great if you would come on board as well. So Thank I don't know you. if people have any questions about that or that's basically what my thinking has been. Yeah, mine, mine too. I just, is there anybody who disagrees? I mean, I feel, kind of almost feel like a no brainer to me, which may be not a fair thing to say because somebody may have a disagreement and I'm, not paying attention, but does it, so are there questions, are there concerns? Are we ready to say yes, let's do this? I'm doing this thumbs up thing again, because all we're doing is saying, if, if everybody's thumb is up, then we're writing a letter, then we're writing the letter. I think I saw Rob's earlier, but he put it back down. All right. So I believe that ends my part of uh, running the meeting and I'll turn it back over to Erica. Thank you. All right. Um, the last sort of item, but we don't have Paul here, was again just asking about the trust vacancy. Um, so my understanding is, is that um, uh, Carol, Paul and I are going to have a conversation. Um, and the update was that um, supposedly there are not too many applicants. Um, but I think what we should look at is, do we have any applicants? And if they're interested, why not go ahead and start interviewing them? Um, at the same time, I would uh, absolutely encourage um, everybody and anybody to, that is interested to please apply. Um, ask, you know, individuals that you know of here in Amherst that are that would be, you know, interested in, in being part of the trust to, to go ahead and apply. But um, we want to fill this vacancy. Um, I think it would be very important to have a full trust membership. Um, and then uh, I want to ensure, or Carol and I want to ensure that if there are any other vacancies that we have an expedited process. This is really such an important issue uh, and such important work. Um, and the more of us that they're here, the more we have thought partners um, and provide diverse opinions on things and um, you know, really have an opportunity to have conversations um, about really, really critical issues of having sustainable, affordable housing across from sheltering all the way to home ownership. Um, so more to come. Um, so Carol and I will meet with Paul and if Paul can't make it, then we'll provide an update. Um, so the next item is just announcements. I have two and I'll open up for any others. Um, Reimagining sheltering, um, they're gonna have a meeting tomorrow um, at 10 o'clock in the morning. Uh, if you need the link, we can certainly give you that link. And then on Monday, the three county individual services committee is meeting from two to three o'clock. Um, are there any other announcements that people would like to share? Okay, um, I don't see any hands up from our attendees either. So um, public comments, any public comments? that haven't been included yet. Okay, then items not anticipated within 48 hours. Anything that someone wants to raise? All right, so uh, for the upcoming meetings, the next meeting is going to be on March 9th and, oh, uh, I was just going to say, and Ashley was going to, maybe you're going to say the same thing, but I was going to say an item for uh, March 9th, um, and if Ashley, you want to speak more to it, Ashley has recommended that we possibly invite Maggie Randolph from the uh, GSD studies to talk about tiny homes, but go ahead, Ashley. Yeah, I was just going to say that, that I just, um, well, I sent an article and a news story to uh, Carol and Erica and Nate. And maybe you guys could just forward that to everybody else so that we know who she is. And it is a tiny home village that is in Dover and it's in the process of being made. I'm not sure their process with um, the town per se, but I guess we can ask her about those things too. And then apparently there's another one. Nate, didn't you say that there was something um, in uh, Worcester? Worcester? Maybe we could we could just find like an article about that or see who the um the developer of that one was 
And so that we just, I mean, this next time for sure, but maybe in general, we start getting some presentations just of, of new developers that kind of just want to introduce themselves and their model to us. Not not like a commitment kind of thing, but just so that we we know what we're working with because I think that we could be meeting some new developers and new models a little more consistently. Thank you, Ashley. The other item is, um, Nate, uh, we're gonna be giving you feedback on the position. And so you're gonna come back with, uh, hopefully on March 9th, um, sort of another rendition of the position. Any other items to put on? Go ahead, Allegra. Ah, I pressed the wrong button. <laughs> um, I was wondering if it would be helpful, and I guess I'm also maybe volunteering myself if people would be interested, because I do think that there were some interesting bills um, that came around in the uh, communication from the Western Mass Network. Uh, I myself am particularly interested in the rent control one. Um, so I don't know if, if people would be interested in hearing a little bit more about those bills. And, and then if so, I will look into them. Yay, Allegra, that, go. That would be great, Allegra. That would be absolutely wonderful. So um, definitely. All right. Oh, actually, I want us to have a finance report next time, which I'm going to talk to Nate about between now and next time also. Okay. Yeah, no, yeah, I guess, yeah, I was going to say, Ashley, sorry, I, didn't, I thought you, the Ashley sent write an article about this tiny home uh, development in New Hampshire, and I thought it went to the whole trust, so I'm sorry, I didn't realize, I'll, I'll afford it, um, but it's great, it's a, I think it's 44 units, it's under construction, um, and you know, it's a, a couple that's doing it, uh, it sounds like all for the right, in, you know, right reasons, and they don't have to be affordable. And so they're actually permanent homes. You know, sometimes people think tiny homes, like, you know, just things on, you know, a trailer, but these are actually, you know, foundations. And uh, I think they're 384 square feet and they're really trying to address the affordability problem with them. It's, it's, it's really interesting um, that it's being built, you know, it's moving forward. It's uh, so yeah, I'll send that along. And then Worcester, they're supposed Great. to be one too, so. All right. And hopefully Allegra and I will meet beforehand and have some more details about the listening session. And I think that's it. Um, if you have any other items that you wanna be uh, put on the agenda, please let Carol and myself know um, and we will try to fit on the agenda or uh, set it up for the next meeting. So last minute comments, insights. Otherwise, we're going to end our meeting at 8.59 and wishing everybody a wonderful evening. Thank you. See you all next month. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.